In today's video, I'm opening up this Maydean 42 set I got for a really good deal on Prime Day. It took a while to come in the mail, but it was definitely worth it. It comes with a water brush, mixing areas, a sponge to wipe things off on, and 42 colors. The watercolors themselves are decent, but I actually bought this to use as a travel palette, so my plan is to take out all these colors. I'm trying not to break them, although some of them will shatter, and I put them into another book, as you'll see. I'm going to test out these colors in this video and do a painting, but I'm also going to show you how I'm actually filling it. This is my old one that I got before. The new one actually has a larger brush. I'm using this palette knife to take the paint out. I don't really care if it breaks. And then I'm going to show you what I'm planning on doing. So in this little paper protector file folder thing, I'm using this glue to glue each one down as I take them off. And then I'm also going to label it. It actually took a while to label it. I skip showing you the whole process and I just skip ahead to me doing the color swatches here. I sprayed everything down so that it would be a little activated and I'm actually pleasantly surprised with how decent these paints are. I make a nice swatch card in the same order that they are here except I skipped doing the white although I could use it to make certain special milky color mixtures later. The real plan for this is to put the paints in. As you can see, I have written everything out. I did several rough versions before I came to the final good copy of exactly what I decided to put in. I'll be leaving some spaces at first here because I'm waiting for another order to come in at the point when I had been doing this in order to get a few other new colors into this new 42 palette. I'm using a bit of a pin here to spread things out. I have a knitting needle I also use to mix up paint. The pliers to open the tubes. Sometimes tubes are difficult to open. As things go on I actually get more practiced and better at this process and I'm taking off any excess paint that's building up here so that if it goes above where the flatness of the lip would be I don't want the paint to hit the underside of the other palette that's on top of it. So I'm very carefully going through. This is obviously extremely sped up, edited, and certain things are trimmed out in this process here. I have a little swatch card that's done in the exact order and I had everything worked out before I even got the palette in. In a couple cases I changed things around for the final version when I realized I was going to be ordering new paints. Some of these are custom color mixes. I'm putting the recipes up on the screen during this video for all the custom color mixes because I think that some of these custom colors are really good. In fact, I think they're great, otherwise I wouldn't have made it into my top 42. It actually beat a couple tube colors into the pans here. I ended up deciding to do the mother color green that I invented using M. Graham quinacridone gold, which is nickel quin gold, and the two different types of thalo green, my ta thalo green blue shade and ta thalo green yellow shade. By mixing these three colors together, I get this amazing, extremely realistic plant green that is really easy to modify from that point to get other realistic plant greens. I'm choosing which tube colors I think are most useful for mixing other colors on the go, as well as which premix specialty colors that I just really enjoy and would like to have on me. I'm using a mix of Chinese white and titanium buff with a little bit of certain other colors that I had previously figured out before. These are vintage pastel dupes. Some of them have very little of another color added in, such as this one here, because there's meant to be pastel colors. You can water down watercolors to get pale tones, but it won't have that milky color, that more opaque milky color that I prefer for some of my pastels to have unless you actually add white paint. So I'm choosing to do that intentionally. I like to use different opacities of paints, not just transparent, not just opaque, and I just like to understand the different colors and what works best for them. During this process, I actually couldn't find one tube of paint I had decided that goes in the 42 palette. My Cobalt Blue by, by Turner Artist Watercolors, or TA for short, and if I can't find it in a little while, I haven't been able to find this tube for a while, I, I might choose a different color, but it'll have to be a mix or a tube paint that would fit purple or blue so it doesn't look horribly out of place. Other than that, I find this process time consuming, but in general fairly relaxing. And there's a lot of fiddling around with scrap pieces of paper to make sure I got the mixes accurate and a fair bit of scooping out with a palette knife extra paint when there's too much. Using a few empty half pans on the side, 
I scrape and even mix multiple colors together that there's too much of. To make some new colors, I put in another side palette. A mix of some of the excess blues and greens makes a new unique blue-green. I also have a, a new unique brown from a mix of the slightly excess brown colors. A lot of these colors are ones that I figured out in order to make dupes of specific colors that I don't actually own, but also to copy colors specifically that I'd like to have as a base color. It's much more useful, in my opinion, to have a lot of these colors pre-mixed. The closer you can get to the color you're actually using in your painting, the faster you can actually paint and spend less time mixing as you're painting. But obviously you can just mix, but do you want to spend more time painting mixing while you're painting, or do you want to pre-mix it and then have it ready to go when you're in the field? I'm finding having these 42 colors, the other 42 colors, and my two other little palettes, which have around 44 half pans each of gouache, extremely helpful. They're very compact. They fit into a backpack and I can bring everything with me and have tons of colors and then mix every other color I want from those colors. It allows me to work very quickly while on the go so that I have the option to work very fast or I can work slower. Remember that you can pause and rewatch sections of the video to write notes down if you want the mixing recipes that are shown on the screen of this video. Don't just try to write it all the first time you watch it. These are a new order of Van Gogh paints that I got during a sale from Curry's Art Supplies. I accidentally bought two transparent medium yellow when I meant to get a rose, which I'll have to get in a future order. But it's a really good color, so it's nice. These are some of the remaining paints I was missing. The other paints you briefly saw are ones I need to replace because the tubes are getting low and I use them for custom mixes. Here I am going through and filling in those gaps that were there previously when I was first filling up the 42 palette. Unfortunately, I still haven't found that missing color at this point, so I might be filling it with something else soon and changing my original plans. But I'm gonna keep looking for a little while longer. Making sure everything fits and fanning it out so it's in a good position for drying. Here's the final swatch card real quick. This one little half pan you saw me do there was just the remaining color that didn't make it into the palette, but it's a new one I have to experiment with. The new colors I got here in this beautiful palette circle I'm making is Matter Lake Light, Permanent Lemon Yellow, Permanent Red Deep, Transparent Yellow Medium, Quinacridone Purple Red, and Azo Yellow Light. I ended up putting the half pan of the Azo Yellow Light and it didn't quite make it into the new 42 palette this time. The yellows are incredibly similar, but I did notice some different properties. They actually look more similar on camera than in person, but they are quite similar. The transparent yellow medium is the most translucent of the three. The Azo Yellow Light is the most, it's hard to explain. It, it's slightly muddier in mixes, but in a way that I find pleasant to my eye. And the permanent lemon yellow is slightly more of lemon, and I'd call it more semi-opaque. I think all three are useful, and it's interesting that I have them now, but it is true that they are actually pretty similar colors. I believe these are all quite light fast as well, although I need to double check. I already know that the permanent lemon yellow is the benzomedalazone yellow that I've been trying to get for a while, but was able to get here cheaper. I have a whole book of these palette circles. I'll eventually do a tour of them because they are very pleasant. I'm just doing a few test mixes here using some of these colors here and making some observations in my sketchbook that I thought I'd share. I'm intentionally mixing the titanium buff Van Gogh in, rose and rose with titanium buff, just to show some of the different mixes. I'm noting some things. The transparent yellow medium is a little more vibrant and translucent, so I thought it would be good with mixing greens, but I find them a little too bright, but that's still a good thing to notice. I'm comparing a couple of these colors here. I will continue to do notes and research going forward. I'll ask you to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you're really enjoying my content. So I decided to do a toucan person, a pikizayo, which is a new race that I'll be featuring in my Great Tree book. I decided because these paints are actually more decent than I thought, they're better than my old set, I thought I'd do the best chance I had. So I did the line art in Procreate, then I put it on my computer, then I printed it onto some good watercolor paper. The problem is there was actually a bit of bleeding because I suppose there's sizing in this paper so it didn't properly settle. 
So I had to be really careful with the ink print bleeding and I had to just take my time and be careful and realize that there were some bleeding issues. I actually think the paints are really good, but I still prefer to take them out and put my own paint in the 42 set, which is the real reason I bought it. Saving them in this binder here, behind the plastic with the little card showing the colors on it and having everything labeled, which took longer than I expected actually, is really useful. So I can keep using these paints if I want to and use the 42 palette more on the road the way I wanted to. As you can see, I'm using some sponges and some larger, softer makeup brushes for the larger areas of the background. I'm doing a fairly abstracted indication of a large jungle with leaves in the background. Pikazayo are toucans, woodpecker, and other relatives as bird people. The word is a word I made up. It comes from the order picaform and the word zygodactyl, which is a term for the type of feet this family of birds have. Two toes forward and two toes backwards. The Picazio raids. I'm not going to give every detail here, but it will be featured in my Great Tree book. I have specialized weapons, which work with bird people especially, that will be featured in the book. And I also have the fact that Pigazio age equivalent to humans. They have an omnivore diet that tends to be high in fruit, but in general similar to humans, high in protein, high in fruit. They can come in small or medium size, but it depends on the world or location. So the dungeon master is encouraged to figure out how it works on their world and to go with that. And they have a special peck attack. Because Pikazio represent everything from toucans to woodpeckers, it's actually a rapid peck. As the character levels up in overall level, regardless of individual classes, but total overall level, they get additional pecking attacks. So they can do a rapid peck. And another interesting thing is that the climb and fly speed is faster than the walking speed because they're awkward on flat ground and actually better at flying and climbing. Pikazio should include species of bird that are toucans, toucanet, aracari, barbet, tinkerbird, piculet, jacamar, puffbird, and woodpeckers, as well as any other close relatives that fit the definition. Some species also include, but are not limited to, black-fronted nunbird, green-backed honeybird, northern wryneck, black-billed barbet, spotted piculet, great barbet, white-eared puffbird, pileated woodpecker, common flame-backed woodpecker, red-breasted toucan, emerald toucanet, and the collared aracari. You should definitely write down the species of bird that your Picazio is based on, so it's easy to tell other people what it should look like. You should look up and research relatives of the bird when you're inventing a new one. Inventing new and mythical but plausible birds of these varieties means comparing to relatives. You can also take one existing bird that you really like the look and shape of, but simply change the colors and patterning to colors that you prefer even more. A few other vital details for accuracy to make it properly look like a Picazio. Make sure to always have zygodactyl feet. Many have very large to huge beaks proportionately, but it should be based on the species of bird. Try to get the beak shape and size proportionately more accurate. You can err on the side of making it slightly smaller in the case of the largest beaked toucans. Many of the legs are far larger and closer to human proportions than they would be on the bird, which has very small legs. However, I think I made the legs slightly too beefy and large here. They should be a little more slender and maybe a little smaller than standard human legs, so they're a little shorter proportionately. They have the six proportionate body plan, so they have wings plus arms and legs. Base the arms more on the way the legs look in terms of the scaling, pattern, and coloration. The wings fold extremely small actually and have a, a very sleek profile and don't stand out a lot. They stand out more if there's a backpack hidden underneath. By putting a narrow backpack design, the wings still keep a fairly low pro profile when folded. A larger backpack should make a bigger bump, especially if covered by a cloak. A cloak is open at the sides and so the wings can come out and they should be able to fly even with a cloak on. Remember to adjust all the clothing to fit. Don't put too much too heavy clothing or it would disrupt flying, but they should still be able to carry and fly with a bit more weight proportionately than a bird of a similar size. Or rather, they should be adapted to carry more weight to function as an adventurer in a story. 
Keep in mind as well that the coloration of clothing could clash, match, or go with the brightly colored feathers if you're using a brightly colored bird. This will affect your perception and which color clothing you prefer, but it's always safe to go with neutral colored clothing. I very much encourage people to include the tail as it's very helpful to steer while flying. Now to get back to some of the painting. I'm using a palette on the side to water it down to different levels. I'm not just working with it directly off, although when I'm going in directly it's because I want to use the paint quite thickly. I'm finding that this paint's actually better than the last time I bought the palette, although I've heard rumors that sometimes you get a good one and sometimes you get a bad one. I got it for quite a good price and this paint's really very decent. I'm glad I saved all the paint in here so I can keep using it as I go forward, although I really did buy the travel set, like I said, to put my own paint in it. I'm trying to do the best I can here. One of the issues is that I used watercolor paper and I think the sizing reacted with the printer ink so that it was actually still reactivating in the water. The, I was getting a bit of blurring from the printer ink so I had to be really careful about it which caused additional complications during this process but overall I still think the artwork turned out quite good. I semi-abstracted the background rather than directly trying to paint a forest. I was thinking a forest or a jungle in the background, probably more accurate to call it a jungle, and I'm trying some of the different colors. I'm looking at the color swatch card to help me know what the colors look like. I'm also able to test things on a side paper after I mix new colors just to see how everything actually works out. It's also good to keep scraps of paper of the similar type of paper to the one you're using to test colors out before you do it on your good final painting. Another tip I would say is to let things dry when they need to. Throughout this process, I don't just paint in a row. I actually sometimes will make corrections, like where I did really quickly there, wet it down and dab paint off that I don't want in a location, and also paint some areas that go up against another area. Then stop painting it, let the painting completely dry, and come back to it once it's dry because putting wet paint up against wet paint is likely to accidentally go over the border and cause bleeding, colors to bleed into other colors. This is a perfectly fine effect when you want it to happen in a picture, but for something more precise like this kind of painting, you would really do well to consider to let it completely dry whenever a color goes right up against another color. Unless you want bleeding, letting it fully dry before coming back is probably the best way of avoiding it. Another thing that you can consider doing is thinking about planning out the colors before you do the final painting. One thing you could do is quickly drop and fill colors digitally to make a digital reference for yourself in a program like Procreate, even before you paint it in traditionally. In this case, I worked it out by looking at a lot of reference and thinking about what I was doing and then coming back in and painting it based on what colors I liked from these paints. But if I was less restricted by just trying to use these paints, for example, and I wasn't recording this video, I could use my iPad as a reference. I'm actually discovering I really like these paints the more I go along with them, and I do intend to keep using them going forward. They're actually surprisingly good. Some of the colors are really quite vibrant and useful including a beautiful green gold, kind of a nickel quin azo yellow. Here I'm coming back after it's fully dried, for example. I made sure everything fully dried before coming back at this point because all the edges of the areas went up against an area and I didn't want any bleeding to happen. I decided that I wanted this color to be a bit darker, but a similar sort of bluish tone. I wanted the blue colors to match the blue of the Toucan Picazio. And I wanted some of the metal effects to be a sort of bluish steel color. I also was thinking about what I wanted to do with the feather colors. I made a lot of the steel kind of a bluish steel in this case. I'm trying to make sure that areas are distinct, but also that the entire thing works as a whole. I use a similar brownish color to the wing tones, and I used a similar blue to the blue on the body. And I use a yellowish brown similar to the yellow in the face for the bow, so everything sort of matches a bit more. With just the red on the beak and at the bottom of the tail feathers standing out. 
and the eyes of course are also red. As you can see the tape kept peeling up so I kept having to push it down. I was cheap and just taped the very corners but the problem is that this washi tape isn't very sticky so it kept peeling up so if you don't want that sort of trouble with paper that's likely to peel like this cheaper watercolor paper is then you probably should tape all the sides flat down and not be cheap like me and use tiny little pieces of washi tape that aren't really that sticky and aren't good enough for the job I'm trying to force it to do. But I was really stubborn so I just kept using them for this painting. I think for the next painting I'll keep in mind that I should consider being willing to use more tape and tape down all the edges. One of the things is I didn't want a harsh edge border going all the way around. I was more interested in having it vignette, which means to not have a harsh border but to fade off into the distance. Once again, that's all for this video. If you like my videos, please remember to like, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell to all notifications so you will know when a new video comes up. I aim for new videos every Wednesday, but sometimes life happens and things are delayed. I hope that you enjoyed this video and will see you with another one very soon.